What's going on YouTube? Welcome to Kovacs Corner for another react video. We are going to be reacting to that guy Glenn's YouTube video on how Pokemon Red and Blue were made. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come through, check the video out, you know how, how we do. And feel free to hit me up on any one of my other social media platforms down in the description below. If you want to support the channel, feel free to hit up the PayPal. Don't feel obligated to a like and a sub is all we need. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe. First time I'm watching it, haven't watched it yet. We're going to get into it. Something that I'm interested in. Everybody likes Pokemon, so let's take a look. Uh, all shoutouts go to that guy, Glenn. Big ups. The origin of the first generation of Pokemon games is a fascinating tale that involves real-life bug catching, trademark difficulties, almost losing years of work, and defying the expectations of... Yeah, the real-life bug catching. The inventor of Pokemon used to collect bugs when he was a kid, and that's how he got the idea for Pokemon. Nintendo, who didn't understand the concept of collecting monsters. To get the full picture, we have to go all the way back to the 70s, when a child named Satoshi Tajiri developed a fascination with cat- The man, the myth, the legend, right there. Brought us Pokemon years and years. What is it? It's almost 30 years, man. Pokemon's almost been around for 30 years. I remember when it dropped like yesterday. Catching and collecting insects in a western Tokyo suburb called Mashida, where Satoshi grew up. He enjoyed exploring the rural parts, such as rice fields, rivers, and forests. On his adventures, Satoshi searched for insects, fish, and other creatures. There was something about the way they moved that mesmerized him. He studied all the creatures he brought home and thought of new ideas of how to catch them. I don't think it was all about the movements of what he was catching. I think that he was just interested in insects and lizards and all that and whatever. The way how most, most of us when we're younger we're interested in bugs and stuff. I know a good majority of young young boys are. That's what they're into, like snakes, spiders, and all that, and whatever, catching bugs. Uh, yeah, I could just see them doing that for fun, looking to see what it is that they do, how they react. I mean, let's get into it still. For example, most of the other kids would catch beetles using honey, but Satoshi had the idea of putting a stone under a tree because beetles sleep during the day and they like sleeping under stones. It made finding them a breeze, and as a result, Satoshi would collect more bugs than all of his friends. Little discoveries like that excited him each and every time. His bug catching skills also earned him the nickname Dr. Bug among the neighboring kids. Aside from exploring his neighborhood, Satoshi was also fascinated with Ultraman on TV and in manga. The you know, Ultraman was the ship growing up. I remember that way back in the day. That was so sick before Power Rangers. He stated in an interview with Time Magazine that if games didn't exist, he would probably be making anime. Satoshi also frequented the local arcade hall starting around 1978. And Yo, know what else is funny? You gotta think about how he invented Pokemon and how there's all those uh, bug catchers. Did he see himself in those bug catchers? And if he did, I, I kind of feel bad about just crushing all those bug catchers on the way <laughs> to the Elite Four, you know what I mean? And became hooked on Space Invaders, which got him more interested in video games. Big game, big Back game. Then, Space Invaders was really huge. Media, at least not where Satoshi lived. Therefore, he took reins into his own hands and created Game Freak magazine in 1983, around the time he started going to college. The magazine was completely handwritten and stapled together by Satoshi himself. It featured secret tips and tricks on how to beat arcade games and was available in specialist bookstores for 200 yen. The most popular issue a buck 75 to 200 yen is a buck 75 so yes age, satoshi already had a real business going one of the people that bought the magazine was none other than ken sugimori who would become the primary character designer and art director for pokemon ken enjoyed reading the magazine and got in touch with satoshi to offer his services as an illustrator from then on the pair collaborated on game freak magazine until it was discontinued so like yo that's pretty cool just like keep doing something he was handwriting it and stapling that that's how he started that's how he started out with a with a magazine like handwritten stapled up and for an artist to get influenced by it, grab it and actually reach out that's cool that's cool the way how they made that connection they quickly became friends and bonded over their love of arcade games 
One day, Ken and Satoshi talked about how arcade games are often very similar, and asked themselves what they would do differently if given the opportunity to develop a video game. Some of the other people reading the fanmade magazine were programmers and had access to game development tools. Pretty soon I had some contributors, and we'd all get together and talk about games. The more I learned about games, the more frustrated I became, because the games weren't very good. I could tell a good game from a bad game. My conclusion was, let's make our own games. By the time Game Freak started developing games, Satoshi's neighborhood had completely changed. A place that was once rich with rivers and forests had now been replaced with housing facilities, office buildings, and stores. And no, it's funny, the first region, well, like, almost all regions of Pokemon, as they were coming out, were just regions of, uh, of Japan, until you start getting into the newer versions. Satoshi thought about all the kids who were now unable to explore nature and collect its mysterious creatures. It was this line of thinking that sparked the initial idea for Pokemon. In the face of more and more urbanization, the young developer wanted to provide an opportunity for kids these days to feel that sensation of going on an adventure, exploring other OG Lapras, I guess. discovering the local critters and creatures. This, combined with his favorite activities such as playing video games and watching Ultraman, laid the groundwork for the first Pokemon games. However, his idea didn't completely click until he saw the original Game Boy in 1989. The link cable capabilities of Nintendo's first handheld console seemed like a perfect fit for Pokemon. Yeah, they wanted that link cable feature to bring people together to share Pokemon between versions and create friendships and stuff like that from like back in the day. I remember reading in Nintendo magazine. Um, Satoshi visualized actual living organisms moving back and forth across the cable. Furthermore, once Satoshi saw the success of the Final Fantasy Legend, the very first RPG for the Game Boy, he was convinced that his idea for a monster collecting RPG was not only possible on the Game Boy, but that it was the only system that could bring his dream game to life. Soon after, Satoshi and Ken officially founded Game Freak as a video game studio, and development on Pokemon began in 1990. The team kicked things off by creating... So, like, the development of Pokemon started in 1990. It's like six, what is that, like six, eight years of development before they drop. Now look at them, man. Look at it. It's a conglomerate now. It's so crazy. A concept pitch document that contained a lot of... Capsule monsters. ...as well as how the game would work. Interestingly, it depicted quite a different version of the world of Pokemon, and this makes sense given that Satoshi and the other creators originally set out to make a more traditional RPG-like game. For starters, the project's original name was Capsule Monsters. Inspired by both the popular Japanese capsule toys called Kashapon dispensed from vending machines and Ultraman's Capsule Kaiju. It's this latter inspiration, however, that got the team into trouble trying to trademark the name, and they eventually had to change it to Pocket Monsters, or Pokemon for short. A common RPG trope, checking into a hotel or inn, was detailed <laughs> in the concept pitch. Of course, players can still go to a Pokemon Center in the final game and heal their Pokemon, but it doesn't offer a room for the player to rest in. Another clear difference from the final games are the shopkeepers. This drawing depicts the main character trying to buy a Lapras from a shopkeeper, who can be seen keeping Pokemon in cages. What? That's crazy, so like, they had the idea that you were able to go and purchase Pokemon just to grab them. Well, there's an opportunity in the Gen 1 games to exchange Pokemons for tokens that sell... I get, yeah, the gambling spot. ...on City, it's certainly not possible in the Pokemarts. The document also features a charisma stat, being able to trade multiple Pokemon at once, and an emphasis on collecting items like you would Pokemon. Additionally... And that item feature didn't come till Generation 2. The included sketches show a talk option when facing a trainer, as well as the total amount of HP and TP each Pokemon has during battles. TP was probably a precursor for PP and most likely stood for technical points. The drawings also depict the ability to sell your Pokemon for gold, the currency that was used before it was switched to yen. Not only that, it's likely that an early idea was to assign a gold value to each Pokemon, as well as an intelligence stat, as evident in this sketch. Super no, it's funny, it kind of seems like he took a lot from uh, Dungeons and Dragons for like character sheets and stuff like that per each Pokemon. I wonder if that's how they still create it to this day. Like if they just got like a, a, spread a spreadsheet marker on a computer that just runs it. Surprisingly, the concept pitch also includes a female version of the protagonist, something that was introduced for the first time in Pokemon Crystal. 
Speaking of the protagonist, an early idea was to let the player character participate in battles. The original player sprite can be seen holding a whip and has a tougher looking physique. At one time, the protagonist would fight as well, but then we asked ourselves, if you can fight on your own, what's the point of having Pokemon? The fact that features such as buying Pokemon from shopkeepers and the player participating in battles were cut from the final game is also a result of the team deciding to treat Pokemon more like friends instead of pets. You know what's funny too? If they had that feature in, you just battle, and then take their Pokemon from them. You would be Team Rocket, that's... <laughs> It was also around this time that Game Freak started to lean more towards the Pokemon collecting aspect and less towards creating a more traditional RPG. When we were writing the text for the Pokedex, we started talking about how fun it was to collect Pokemon. We felt a story about a boy traveling to fill up his Pokedex was more appropriate for modern times than a tale of a hero battling an evil villain. An early sketch of the Kanto map can also be found inside the document and reveals early landmarks based on the real-life Kanto region in Japan. These landmarks were later reworked into locations such as a Pokemon Tower and Saffron City. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I like the way how he ended up basing it off of where he grew up. That's pretty cool. Fun fact, Pallet Town is based on Satoshi's hometown Mashida. Yeah. The Pokeball, referred to as Monster Capsule in the document, also looked quite differently from the final version. Its white and red colors are switched and the button is located on the bottom instead of the side of the ball. Based on this sketch, it's speculated an early idea might have been to shrink down Pokemon to fit inside their Pokeballs, instead of being absorbed by a beam of light. Ken Sugimori, who led the design team, and Atsuko Nishida started drawing loads of different Pokemon designs. Atsuko is actually the one who came up with the design for Pikachu, the three starter Pokemon, and many others. That's cool. Ken always finalized each design and drew every Pokemon in multiple angles to make it easier for his colleagues to get a good understanding of all the pocket monsters and render them the correct way. Both artists kept sketching more and more Pokemon, a lot more than the 151 that ended up in the games. The concept document confirmed that over 200 different Pokemon were considered and were in various stages of completion. Developers at Game Freak later confirmed in interviews that multiple Pokemon were indeed scrapped and that the total number was reduced to their favorite 151 designs. This took a lot of effort according to Junichi Masuda, who worked on the original games as a composer, programmer and designer. To Bro. Composer, programmer and designer. Dude's a jack of all trades. Are you serious? Wow. That's nuts. And to think that, like, they had the color switch, it wasn't really switched, right? It was just upside down. <laughs> to facilitate this and make sure everyone at Game Freak was happy with the designs, the studio organized popularity polls every so often where all the devs were able to provide Get some stats going. for feedback. The general look of all Pokemon also went through Coffee. some changes. At the start of development, most designs had a rather consistent look to them, often resembling dinosaur-like monsters. So it's no coincidence that the first three Pokemon ever designed were Rhydon, Clefairy, and Lapras. Lots of designs were also- that, That's Clefairy right there. That does not look like a Clefairy to me, man. <laughs> created with specific roles in mind, because early on, the devs envisioned Pokemon living alongside humans to help them with specific tasks. Along the way, the developers discovered that battles were rather boring if there's only weak and strong Pokemon. It was clear they needed to introduce more variety in the designs and find a way to make battles more engaging. Therefore, types were introduced to the game's concept midway through development, and now... The Ended up throwing types in halfway through. That's insane for them to get the deadline done too. The artists started to think about designs based on specific types such as water and fire. It simultaneously added some much needed strategy to the combat. Furthermore, it gave the team the idea to begin the player's journey by letting them choose a starter Pokemon that's either water, fire or grass type. An early drawing also showcases a Pokemon hatching from an egg, something that was later introduced in Pokemon Silver and Gold. Yeah. When all the 151 Pokemon designs were finished and approved, they started brainstorming about all the attack moves each Pokemon could use. So, like, that must have been a tedious task and a half. Like, you gotta pull up the sprite of the Pokemon, figure out what typing it is, and then you gotta, like, make a pool of moves, of move sets that they're able to do. And then to be able to, like, pinpoint what moveset goes where, 
like Raise Relief, obviously Grass type, Thunder, Electric type, and stuff like that. But like, uh, where, where, what would be a good one to see? Like Confusion, nah. Well, no, I guess because they have normal typing too, right? Which moves. Instead, the team came up with the moves separate from their Pokemon designs and then gradually assigned moves that would fit well with each Pokemon. Just this process of designing the Pokemon and their moveset alone took about three years to complete. Nowadays, we're used to getting yearly Pokemon games, but Satoshi and his team were coming up with the popular formula of exploring mysterious areas, collecting Pokemon, and fighting your way through all the gyms for the first time ever. Additionally, the team back then was much smaller compared to the 150 plus employees working at Game Freak now. Junichi remembers how only they have the original 151. The original <laughs> we could hardly even be called a company at the time. We were just almost like a college club or something, where people who were interested would just gather and hang out. They'd come to work whenever they want, leave whenever they want. Some people would be sleeping over because they worked so hard into the night. Something the team focused on from the very beginning was interactive communication. Most so just imagine that you're so, so in depth in this project that you're enjoying yourself, you're having a great time. Like the bosses don't care whether you come or go, whatever time you decide to come through, whatever time you decide to go home, but would you spend the night working on the game, I guess, to test it, right? have like a game night for everybody i don't know man it's a different work culture over there in japan too right so most other developers were using the game boys link cable to compete but satoshi saw it as a way to exchange data between players while he likes competition too he explained that the concept of one-on-one -on -one communication is very japanese and he wanted to translate that to a video game Implementing trading would unfortunately become one of the most challenging aspects throughout development, since it was only possible to transfer tiny amounts of data between two Game Boys. Junichi admits that the technology just wasn't there yet, but Game Freak fought to make it happen anyway. A staple of Pokemon games is that every generation has at least two versions, but this idea actually didn't come from Game Freak themselves. The developers were thinking of how to make trading more attractive for players, but couldn't immediately come up with the right idea. When Satoshi went to Nintendo to talk about their progress, none other than the creator of Mario, Shigeru Miyamoto, suggested creating two separate cartridges with exclusive Pokemon to catch so people would be motivated to trade with each other. Rare and legendary Pokemon that are more difficult to catch were also included for the same reason. With an emphasis on interactive communication and shifting from treating Pokemon as friends instead of pets, it's no surprise that Satoshi explained that he's careful about violence in video games, which is why Pokemon faint rather than die. When a Pokemon runs out of HP, Satoshi was very careful in communicating to the player that the Pokemon is still alive through the animation, the text on screen, and sound effects. I think that young people playing games have an abnormal concept about dying. They start to lose and say, I'm dying. It's not right for kids to think about the concept of death that way. They need to treat death with more respect. So, like, yo, that's actually pretty smart. That's cool that he did that. Not only that, but for young kids, for the concept of, like, death always occurring. And then not only that, but if you were playing, your Pokemon were to, like, actually die, and they use the word death, and, like, dead instead of faint. I'm pretty sure that would be the end of that Pokemon. You wouldn't be able to use that Pokemon again. There was one extremely stressful moment during development that could have destroyed years of work and perhaps even prevented Pokemon from ever releasing. The original games were developed on Unix computer stations that crashed fairly frequently, but the Dash learned how to deal with it without ever losing important data. Except for one time after about four years of development when they had to deal with a very bad crash. Damn. Nobody at the studio knew what to do, or how to recover the data that had all of the Pokemon, the main character, the map, and pretty much everything else that was created until that point. Junichi recalls That's thinking crazy. that if they can't recover the files, they would be ruined. After contacting the old company he used to work for, asking people online for help, and reading multiple books about the Unix machines, Junichi and the rest of the team eventually figured out how to recover the data. The soundtrack, sound effects, and Pokemon cries were all composed by Junichi. To That's something this, crazy to think about, too. For each cry, how each Pokemon sounds, I guess it's... It's kind of a little bit of a cop-out. Because each Pokemon just says its name, right? But, uh... 
for the sound that goes behind it if it's like rough or I don't know I guess it all depends on the appearance of the Pokemon only four available sound channels to work with Junichi had to get extra creative to compose a memorable and fitting soundtrack for the first Pokemon games as well as unique cries for each Pokemon Near the end of development in 1996, the team started to get really worried about releasing their games on the Game Boy. The console was almost 7 years old at that point, and it was clear that, at least in Japan, the Game Boy was on a steep decline. It was so bad, in fact, that when the team talked to friends in the game industry, their friends would sound surprised and comment that it's probably not going to sell very well. Even Nintendo had its doubts about the project and didn't expect much from it. Earlier on in development, Satoshi was even told that Nintendo didn't really understand the concept of the game and the appeal of collecting monsters. Furthermore, there was a notion in the Japanese game industry that role-playing games created by a Japanese company may not sell well overseas. So, okay. so like, I, I think that's funny because you translate it over to today and that's all anybody's really playing. And everybody's playing emulators for Game Boy, you know, and like Pokemon's huge. It's crazy huge. Like the when it dropped, the wave that it made was insane, right? That's why it gave it, gave it its positioning that it's in today. Back in the day, it's it's cool that they actually took that chance. That he took that chance and stuff. Even though everything was on a decline in Japan. They have to like think about how it came over to the West and the timing and stuff because in the West, something that's seven years over there was probably two, three years over here. Game Freak wasn't even thinking Maybe about four. releasing it outside of Japan at the time. It's safe to say that both Game Freak and Nintendo weren't expecting all that much from Satoshi's pocket monsters. Selling a million units, for example, would defy their wildest expectations. Not only that, but like the artwork and stuff like that before anime was really popular the way how it is. I could see the way how they could look at it and be like, I'm not sure that Westerners would be into this style of animation or whatever. But it's cool that it's like, it's a role play game with pets. And the story, the storyline, like, as long as it came out with the anime, the way how it did, it had a dope storyline everybody was already enthralled with it before they even dropped the game even though the game was already out in japan before it even made it over here we had the opportunity to watch uh to watch the anime to get invested into it before we ended up getting the game in japan that day the whole team went to different stores to see how the games were doing and they could tell it was actually selling fairly well of course without social media or the internet as we know it today they didn't know if people were actually enjoying it and what the exact numbers were for copies sold pretty soon however the developers saw the pauses from nintendo coming in hinting red and green were selling even better than they expected not long after, newspaper articles were saying how Pokemon was becoming the new big thing with kids, and its Huge. popularity quickly started to accelerate from there. It wasn't until later when you started seeing, okay, there's going to be an animated series. Oh, there's going to be a card game. Now there's a manga weekly publication. When those things expanded into this multimedia thing in Japan, we really started to feel like, oh whoa, this is a big deal now. The overwhelming success of Red and Green gave Game Freak the opportunity to develop an improved version called Pokemon Blue and was made available exclusively Which is for Pokemon the Yellow. of Koro Koro Comic in October 1996. It removed a number of bugs and featured graphical changes such as overhaul tile sets, new sprites for all the Pokemon and more. Unsurprisingly, Blue was used as the basis for all the localized versions and oh, the American snap. one is responsible for switching Pokemon Green with Pokemon Blue. Originally, it was kind of based on how people feel about and view different colors. The clearest split for us was between red and green, but when we started thinking about abroad, it was clear that wasn't the case. In America in particular, it's red and blue that are considered opposites, if you will. Localizing Pokemon was by far the biggest technical challenge Game Freak had to deal with, and this all came down to capacity. Squeezing all 151 Pokemon into the original games was already a difficult task, and they had to use clever techniques to make everything work on the cartridge. Unfortunately, the team discovered that English takes up more space than Japanese. Junichi admitted they hadn't really considered localization during development, so changing things like Pokemon names, the name entry screen and the Pokedex, which were all specifically designed in Japanese, was far more difficult and time consuming than anticipated. 
Well, think about it. You already have a bunch of set names, a bunch of set moves and everything. Everything's already in Japanese, right? To translate it over, some things don't translate the same way how it does from Japanese to English. So, like, they had to redo everything. Man, talk about time consuming, but it was a hit, man. It paid off. Before the games would take America by storm, the animated Pokemon TV show was released weeks prior and yeah. proved to be a smart strategic move to get people excited about Pokemon as a universe. After eight years in development officially began, Pokemon eight Red and years Blue finally of released development. in North America, and soon in the rest 1998, of the world, turning right. Pokemon into a global unforeseen success. In 1997, it was already the best-selling game in Japan surpassing even Final Fantasy VII with 3.65 million copies sold. The games duplicated that achievement in the United States in 1999 by selling 6.1 million copies. Estimated total worldwide sales million. over 1 million copies for the first generation of Pokemon games alone. Holy. An important contributing factor for these numbers is the fact that lots of people were buying both versions available to them. You, you see that? 30... what? 31 million copies sold. 31 million copies. And how much was the game? It was like 40 bucks. So 31 million times 40. <sighs> Bank. Copies for the first generation of Pokemon games alone. An important contributing factor for these numbers is the fact that lots of people were buying both versions available to them. What began as a way to motivate players to trade turned into an unexpected financial boost. Junichi Masuda recalls the ridiculous amount of product review requests of companies that wanted to make Pokemon merchandise once the games were available overseas. And while the games certainly generate a lot of money, even to this day, it's the merchandise that catapulted Pokemon to the highest grossing media franchise of all time. The global success billion. of the anime also prompted Game Freak to create yet another version of the first generation of Pokemon games called Pokemon Yellow. It was made with the purpose to more closely resemble the TV show, and featured elements like Pikachu as the only starter, your rival receiving Eevee, Team Rocket, and more. Game I know it's funny about that. We were actually supposed to receive Eevee off rip. It was supposed to be Eevee and Jigglypuff against each other. Or, uh, in the manga, is Clefairy. Pretty sure it was either Clefairy or Jigglypuff. Let me know down in the comments if you know. Freak learned invaluable lessons during those first six years of developing Red and Green, which were both very liberating and very challenging. Even though the studio had to work on other projects to keep the lights on, the initial freedom as a young company allowed them to not care about things like sales and investors, resulting in the team solely focusing on being as creative as possible and considering every single idea that came to mind. Despite numerous aspects potentially holding the original games back, it managed to thrive way beyond Game Freak's and Nintendo's expectations. Satoshi's original vision of exploration and monster collecting obviously struck a chord with both kids and adults, and continues to do so today. When you're a kid and you get your first bike, you want to go somewhere you've never been. I would say more so today than back then because back then all it was was like the kids a good majority of the time like don't get me wrong some adults were into it because they understood the collectability of it but they were looking at it as investments right it was like our gener my generation of kids that blew up with pokemon and stuff so now you have adults teenagers young adults and kids all loving pokemon all at the same time because it's something that we grew up with and able to pass down to our family so pokemon's here to stay forever bro before that's like pokemon everybody shares the same experience but everybody wants to take it someplace else and you can do that receiving a bicycle as a present catching bugs and going fishing i realized that all of these experiences that i felt were just mine were shared by all kids I guess that's why people all around the world embraced it. So that was that. That was that. By that guy, Glenn. Check his channel out. I'm going to drop a like on that. That was dope. Learn some stuff for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah, it's crazy the phenomenon of that pokemon became right how pokemon blew up and everything like that back in the 90s and now here in the 2000s everybody celebrates pokemon they're pretty much going on 30 years right think about it 30 years 
Dragon Ball Z has that legacy too to, to be on for that that long too you know what I'm saying but yeah no nah, uh, that's dope as fuck man that was dope so all shout outs to uh, that guy Glenn for all the work that he did I appreciate him doing that for us to react to for us to watch and stuff like that uh, yeah until next time man I hope everyone has a good one peace